welcome to the HR online surgery. We have with us today Gary Morrison, who's a senior lawyer from Co-ops UK. He has extensive knowledge of employment law. We have Kate Fielding, who's the Co-ops UK HR reward and policy manager and a member of the Chartered Institute of Personal Development. And we also have Tim Knowles, who's an expert in employment law, HR policy, employee relations, and a qualified solicitor. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna let you just um, hear the panel speak, just say a little bit about themselves and what they've been dealing with um, the past couple of weeks, and, uh, and then we'll take your questions from there. Gary? Gary, would you like to unmute yourself? Sorry, apologies for that. That's all right, thank you. I'm Gary Morrison. Over the past couple of weeks, I've um, been dealing with a number of queries in a number of areas. First of all, it was um, self-isolation and SSP, uh, moving on then to things like furloughing, um, and what should be paid, um, shielding, um, even had some queries on the working time regulations and whether they still apply uh, at the moment. Thanks. Kate? Thanks, Irina. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so um, for me, it's more around the HR and employee relations side of things. So um, looking at your relationships with your employees, if you're needing to furlough employees, whether or not they're um, amenable to that, whether there are um, issues between different employees if you're asking some employees to go on furlough leave and other employees to continue working um, and any impact that that has um, in the employee relations between your teams. And Tim, thank you Kate. Hi, good afternoon everybody. Um, I've been working in three areas phased over the last three weeks really. I think the first week was concentrating on leave and pay. Uh, the second week was dealing with furloughing uh, in the main uh, and this week it's moved on to um, preparation with employers um, for what could be uh, uh, the more um, disturbing side if cases develop um, and thinking about welfare measures for staff where either they or somebody close to them becomes unwell. Okay, thank you. And I think there's a combined experience of about 35 years between you, so that's useful to know. And also, Tim, did you say that there was some kind of disclaimer to the advice that's given today that you wanted to share? Of course, thanks for reminding me, Irina. Um, we, most of the uh, attendees that I saw on the list are members of Cooperatives UK, and there's nothing preventing us giving legal advice to members of Cooperatives UK. Um, that's fine, but a few of you have signed up <clears throat> for the webinar. Um, we, we can answer questions generically, um, but we, we can't give legal advice on the specifics of your own issue or the circumstances of one of your uh, employees if you're not a member of Cooperatives UK. Um, but we'll give generic advice, our understanding of the guidance that's been published um, and you will be able to get information from our website as well. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so we've got a few, I know we've got questions coming in thick and fast. We've got a few that have been um, emailed to us prior to the webinar, and I'm sure that it'll be relevant to many people. So it's, you wouldn't be surprised to know that most of the um, discussions have been about furloughing and the um, questions coming in. The furloughing issue seems to fall into two camps the questions related to the technicalities of furloughing and then there's a second um section that's um, kind of unfolding which is all about the creative ways of how to deal with furloughed staff so just going on the technicality side of things first um i'll just go through some of the questions that are coming in hopefully they're relevant to others as well um what are sensible example um what are the sensible examples of selection criteria for selecting furloughed workers um when will we be able to apply and when will wages be, be reimbursed to them? Um, in the guidance, HMRC talks of 
retrospective audit to confirm eligibility. Is there any further information on this? So over to you. Um, well, I'll, I'll start with the first ones, if you like. Um, I think in, re in relation to the following scheme, um, this is going to be administered by HMRC. It's going to be an online system. You calculate your claim in accordance with their guidance and input the details. Um, it's scheduled to become open at the end of April. So it's in development by HMRC. And they're saying that they will establish back payments very quickly. Um, you can claim three weeks at a time, um, but no more than one claim in every three weeks. Um, we don't know what the retrospective audit will look like. What I strongly suspect is that because they hold PAYE information already about staff, um, there will be some kind of background checking system um, where they'll um, see whether the claim that you've made is within certain parameters um, and if it falls outside those parameters I suspect they will look at things. We don't know what the HMRC audit process will be um, and uh, I think we'll have to wait, wait and see. Um, any HMRC audit process tends to be quite intimidating. They ask for a lot of information um, and they follow up on that information once they have the details from you. Um, in terms of selection for furloughing, I think one of the main selection issues is, is going to be where has work ceased um, for one reason or another. Um, trade may have gone down in particular areas. Uh, business units may have had to close. Um, and I think a primary selection criteria is going to be led by um, who is unable to work because of COVID-19. Um, you can put other selection criteria. They may be forward-looking in terms of skills um, or knowledge and experience that you need to fulfill what work is left to do. Um, but other than that, it's trying to adopt uh, selection criteria that don't in any way discriminate uh, against anyone indirectly. Um, and as with any, I think the best guidance to look at online, because you can't see uh, immediate guidance about fair redundancy selection, uh, fair following selection processes, um, but there's plenty of information online about fair redundancy um, and the type of criteria you might use in those circumstances. And I think you could adopt a similar approach when choosing people to follow. Okay. Um, in terms of eligibility, uh, is there a firm eligibility criteria apart from considering laying off um, due to the COVID-19 impact? For example, do you have to be down 50% before it kicks in? I guess that's before you, you feel eligible. 50% down on takings? No, I mean, my understanding is, is that um, you don't need to demonstrate that actually you're in a position where you may cease trading or you're at risk of ceasing trading. The whole purpose of the uh, following job retention scheme is to avoid redundancies effectively. Um, as Tim said, in respect to the selection, um, any sort of selection for who should be followed really will be very similar to um, who might be made redundant. There's, there's no criteria, as far as I'm aware, that says uh, you need to uh, be down in trading or have ceased trading or be on the verge of ceasing trading. Um, it is just a matter of ensuring that you can demonstrate that the whole purpose is to avoid uh, making people redundant. Mm. Um, other questions, again, on the kind of technical side of things, they would like to make uh, use of the scheme, are they able to backdate the following to the 1st of March if staff have been working throughout the month of March? Um, 
I'm happy to pick that up. Yeah. Um, you can only back date it if actually staff have not been working in that period. Um, you can back date to prior to the furloughing coming in to the 1st of March, provided your employees were already employed on or before the 28th of February. Um, so effectively what they're saying is if you have made somebody redundant prior to the furloughing scheme coming in and you would like to retain that person's employment, then you can back date to the 1st of March. I think that's a great point you make, Gary, that um, the trigger to um, beginning these payments is agreeing with staff that they're going to be laid off. So whilst you can claim back to 1st of March, that's intended to, be, to cover those staff who have been laid off. Yeah. Um, and then quite quickly, we're going into a lot of the questions which are all around kind of the creative thinking around furloughing. So they range, um, but I'll go through some of the ones that have come online at the moment. So um, can furloughed staff volunteer for the organisation that has furloughed them? What are the limitations of this, including the number of hours, and how can this be checked, or how will this be checked? Do we know even? I can answer that if you like. So um, we know that um, furloughed staff can't work for an organisation if it's going to um, further them economically or help them in that way. So volunteering for your own organisation, my understanding is that 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 is a no-no. They can volunteer for other organisations, so obviously for the NHS, for, for other um, key, key organisations at this time, but not for their own organisation. Um, other questions around um, the use of furloughing as well. Can directors be furloughed? Um, and if so, do they still have decision-making powers if remaining members of the co-op hold meetings to discuss important topics um, in their absence? So to follow somebody, they need to be on PAYE. So if they're um, employed and subject to deductions on PAYE, they can certainly be followed. Um, you can, as far as we can see, there, are, there will be a distinction between director's duties and work as an employee. Um, and therefore, it should be possible for you to undertake governance duties whilst you're furloughed. Um, <clears throat> the key point that Kate already mentioned is that whilst you can, uh, you, you're not allowed to work and the way that they're defining that is making money for your employer or providing services to your employer. So the only exceptions to that we think are going to be governance duties for directors and as you'll have seen in the guidance, you can also undertake training. Um, I suppose it's possible to do voluntary work for your employer, but not if that, that involves making money or providing services. Mm. I, I've certainly read some guidance that says as a director, provided you're an employee, you can be furloughed, but um, you are able to do um, or carry out or continue with your statutory duties as a director. Okay, um, so just checking for any problems. If worker is furloughed for three weeks, then works for one week, then furloughed for thir further three weeks, and then works for one week and so on. And we've had this, call, uh, this question before coming in via email as well. Basically, can we furlough for three weeks, have them working for one week, and then furlough for three weeks? My, my understanding is that, yes, you can. Uh, the minimum period of furlough is three weeks. Um, you can rotate staff um, to avoid, again, the whole purpose is to avoid permanently laying them off or making them redundant. Uh, so, yes, you can rotate staff to the extent that um, they will come in and out, possibly even on a rota. Um, but there's a minimum period of three weeks um, furlough. I mean, one, th one thing I would emphasise as well is if you are going to furlough employees, then you, you have to have their agreement. Um, unless you've got a provision within the contract or perhaps a collective agreement or some relevant agreement that allows you to lay employees off, you have to have their agreement to lay them off or furlough them. 
but, but mm. as I'm aware, there's no reason why you can't rotate, provided the period that any particular employee is furloughed for is a minimum of three weeks. Okay, and will they need proof of contracted hours? Um, how does it work with dates and timings? Do we start on the first of the month? Does it matter? Um, don't know if anyone can help on that. Yeah, well, I think the way the area to look at is not about hours of work, it's about how much you can claim and how you can calculate that. It may be distinct from uh, what they would have worked had they carried on working. Um, but uh, essentially, you can claim back what the, the hire of what they were paid in the same month a year ago for average earnings for the last 12 months. So it's not really a question of how many hours or what the working pattern is, is or would have been, but for this happening, it's a question of what you can claim and how you calculate that. Okay, I'm keen to um, invite other people to talk as well, those that are phoning in and those that want to um, um, verbalise their questions. So Kelvin, if yours is, I can see your hands up, if yours is um, in the same remit, let's get you to, um, to pose your question to the panel. Can you hear us? Kelvin Tebbs. Yes, I can hear you. What Go are ahead. I doing? Hello? Go ahead, just speak into the computer and the panel is ready to answer your question. All right. I've uh, been listening to this. I just want to know, I've been diagnosed as one of the high risk people and I've been told to self-isolate for 12 weeks. All I want to know is, do I get paid for them 12 weeks or not? Thank you, Kelvin. Uh, hi, Kelvin. Um, I'll do my best to help you. Um, which co-op do you work for? Uh, Scarebit Road, Boston. That's one of the Lincolnshire food stores? Yes, that's correct. Well, um, I, we can only um, give advice to member organisations, I'm afraid, Kelvin. So um, what I suggest you need to do is speak to the HR team. And indeed, you're doing that because there's two of them on the webinar today. Um, who are participants like you are. Um, so what I suggest is about your um, self-isolation or rather uh, the social distancing, the 12 weeks that you've got to do, um, speak to uh, Lincolnshire Co-op's HR team who should be able to give you some guidance. Right, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, thank you, there's, a, there's a, a kind of related question. How should we treat employees who ask to stay at home even if they can't work from home because they live with someone who is in the vulnerable or extremely vulnerable group where they can't be furloughed? Well, my understanding is that, uh, uh, is it the employee who's in the vulnerable group, group or the person who's lived, who they're living with? Sorry, Irina who they live with. So somebody they're living with is in the vulnerable or extremely vulnerable group. Because the people who've been in, identified as being in the vulnerable group have had letters or the high risk people, um, which, which takes them into the, the realm of what they term as shielding. My understanding is that if they're living with people uh, who are within the vulnerable group, then they may be self-isolating and may be uh, due to SSP under the new regulations. Okay. Could I just add something to that? Um, the, so we have a lot of different uh, technical phrases um, popping up in the guidance and the policy announcements that have been made. Um, <clears throat> so self-isolation is the 7 or 14 day period, may even stretch to 28 where you're showing symptoms or you live with somebody that's showing symptoms, um, which we know is clearly going to trigger sick pay, even if it's not you personally that's, uh, that's showing the symptoms. Um, uh, so if you live with somebody who's symptomatic, uh, sick pay is triggered for the self-isolation uh, period. Um, if you're um, at, 
if you're in a vulnerable group, you'd probably be advised to work at home where you can. Um, if you're in uh, one of the extremely uh, at-risk groups, you'll have been told to isolate uh, for 12 weeks. Um, the living with somebody um, and supporting them through social distancing, perhaps particularly stringent social dis distancing, so you don't want to go to work, the legal position is SSP is not triggered. Uh, and there's no right to pay if you choose not to go into work in those cir circumstances. Um, but um, many co-ops are adopting uh, different solutions to this. Um, so um, there, there are many examples of ways in which people are trying to support their employees. One of the ways that they're doing it is through having special payment provisions. Another way that a lot of uh, employers are doing it um, is through investigating this furloughing scheme to see whether or not it could be agreed that somebody is furloughed because they're stringently social isolating um, and thereby uh, some employment costs could be recovered. And the government guidance seems to indicate that that could be done by agreement. Okay. Um, somebody's asking, can we require, encourage staff to do training while furloughing? I think you've answered that. Is that yes? Yeah, Go that's, ahead, Tim. Yeah, that's one of the express things that's mentioned. Um, <clears throat> The only thing that to remember about period time for if you do choose to reduce wages to 80% because it's the maximum you can claim back, whilst they're not working, that might be below the national living wage. And the government has said that's okay because they're not working. But the only proviso on training is that everyone must at least be paid the national living wage for training time. Um, can you confirm if the maximum 2,500 gross is, is gross or net pay? It's, it's gross pay, I think, yeah. So you can claim, as, as far as we can see it, the 2,500 is the cap on the gross pay that you can claim, but there are some on costs that you can claim on top of that. Um, and it seems... On top of that, you may be able to get, uh, for example, employers national insurance and uh, and some other um, on costs of employment. So pension maybe, contributions, Tim. Sorry? Pension contributions, employers That's pension. Right. Yeah, thanks, Kate. It's pension contributions up to the auto-enrolment yeah. level but nothing beyond that that you pay as, a, as an em employer. Thank you for that question, Kate. Um, so employees need to agree to be furloughed if they withhold agreement, so the employer is forced to make them redundant. Are they entitled to full pay for the delay and cons consultation period? Um, yes, it, it would be my answer. Um, if, if an employee doesn't agree, the whole purpose of the job retention scheme is to avoid redundancies. Um, if somebody's not able to, uh, if somebody's not prepared to agree um, to be furloughed, um, and if you haven't got any flexibility within the contract, which may allow you to uh, redeploy them elsewhere, then you may be faced with um, a redundancy situation. Uh, and that would be dealt with as you would deal with any other redundancy ordinarily. You'd need to go through the formalities of consulting with them and meeting with them to try and avoid the redundancy. Um, that would be a process um, which, whilst ongoing, the employee would remain an employee, so they would continue to be paid, um, following which you'd need to provide notice and perhaps a redundancy payment if applicable. Mm, okay. 
Um, as we're unsure what to do about holiday, we notice the guidelines for key industry are relaxed, but we're not in that category. Can we still carry holiday over? And we're trying to work out our approach on how we use the holiday. Uh, yes, so in fact, the um, the government have announced that you they are relaxing the worker time regulations to allow you to carry holiday forward when you wouldn't normally be allowed to. Um, so the four weeks, your first four weeks of holiday entitlement, you're now allowed um, to carry forward for the next two years if need be. Uh, but the remaining 1.6 week of holiday leave, you which you can currently, by agreement, carry forward for one year, is still only for one year. Um, but obviously, you need to you'd need to think about um, the well-being sides of allowing employees to to take their holidays um, as and when they're able to. So we wouldn't advise you sort of forcing employees to carry carry holidays forward um, unless you really needed to from um, a business perspective. Okay. Um, we've got some more questions coming in about statutory sick pay. I'll come to those in a moment. Uh, so again, just more creative ways of thinking about the furloughing. And if a worker signed a contract a month ago, to begin on the 1st of April, can that staff member still be furloughed if COVID-19 has resulted in all work being cancelled by clients? So you, you must have been on the payroll on the 28th of February. Uh, the following scheme uh, won't cover you um, if you were employed after that. Um, <clears throat> the only circumstances somebody could be brought back is where a few weeks ago you made somebody redundant. You can now bring them back and follow them. Um, no guidance on what you do if you've paid them a redundancy payment or anything like that, but we know in those circumstances, people can be re-engaged and furloughed. Um, but uh, it won't cover somebody beginning work on the 1st of March or the 1st of April. You, the only, um, carry on, Gary. You may, you may be able to look at, in those circumstances, maybe the statutory layoff scheme that existed before um, furloughing came in. To operation um, again you would need um, somebody's unless you've got a contractual right to lay somebody off you would need their agreement to lay them off um, as Tim correctly says the following scheme doesn't apply unless you were employed on or before the 28th February so you're left with this statutory um, layoff scheme which means that you will lay an em employee off or a worker off uh, you've got to pay them uh, guaranteed pay which is period of five days within a three month period um, and each the daily payment for each day is limited to £29 so it's the daily rate of pay or £29 whichever is the lower you've got to pay that for one week in 13 um, and then you're um, liable to pay that again um, it's not much uh, pay for the employee but it does actually avoid them being made redundant and they can during any period of that statutory layoff um, seek to claim benefits uh, from the benefits agency. Okay any more on that then um, email us and if you're needing the support of our staff and uh, you want to become a member then just um, let us know through membership at uk.coop. Um, similarly other people wondering whether they can challenge the, the start date of furloughing. They have two part-time staff that would have started with them on the 2nd of March, but if the 28th or 29th of February had fallen on the Monday, I guess that would be the 2nd of March, and not on the Saturday, they would have been eligible. Interesting question about whether to challenge. I, I, you won't be able to challenge it with HMRC, I don't think. Um, so the only route that I couldn't think of would be to, uh, lobby government perhaps through uh, members of parliament etc but the rules would need to change uh, to be able to challenge that okay um yeah another one can furloughed staff in the 
fill in the government furloughing portal or does that count as work? <laughs> I would think it probably does. Um, I think I think in some some employments they're going to have to, aren't they? Um, and it does say you're not allowed to make money for your employer. Um, but I think given that you're just recovering costs um, and the purpose of the work is um, avoiding making redundancies, um, I can't see that causing an issue. Um, do we need one person to keep working in order to apply for the government help? Um, oh, sorry, we've done that one. Anything from the new COVID legislation that we need to be aware of? Um, and could we have a quick summary about the statutory sick pay section? Mm. Um, I think in terms of the, if you're talking about the Coronavirus Act, that was put through Parliament last week. There's actually not much in it from a HR perspective. Um, we've updated our website with all of the content about volunteering for the NHS or for social services. So there's lots of FAQs on our website about volunteering and those provisions were actually set out in the Coronavirus Act. Um, Unfortunately, in relation to SSP and things like that, um, all of the provisions in the Act just give uh, government the power to lay regulations down. Um, so they can do that much more quickly than an Act of Parliament. Um, uh, and all the Act does is enables them to do it. So we're going to have to keep, our, keep an eye out on uh, changes to SSP. So at the moment, we're waiting for those. Um, they have said <clears throat> SSP is going to be uh, a day one right. Uh, that will be backdated to the 13th of March. Um, and if you're an employer that employs less than 250 people, um, a number which they <clears throat> take from the 28th of February, again, another uh, reference to the 28th of February, if you employ less than 250 people, you can claim back statutory sick pay uh, payments. And the main points I'd take home about SSP are that it's going to be payable, obviously, where somebody's ill, whether it's coronavirus or, or, or something else. But it's unique in relation to coronavirus um, because you might not be ill. If somebody in your house... Um, is showing symptoms, uh, you should be self-isolating. The household should be self-isolating for 14, 14 days. Um, <clears throat> and so, so even if you've no symptoms whatsoever and you don't get any symptoms within the 14 day period, uh, uh, you're deemed sick for SSP purposes. I think, I think that's the best overview of what we know about the sick pay statutory sick pay provisions so far but there is more, there is more to come on that and we will update the faqs on our website when they bring in that subordinate legislation okay just staying a little bit on the theme of sick pay can we furlough staff on purely medical reasons because they are for example shielding due to an ongoing medical condition and also if someone is furloughed and then goes back to uh, and then goes sick, do they remain on furlough pay or sick pay? Some colleagues get enhanced sick pay, so would they get 100% pay if sick? So with respect to the selection for furloughing, the, the, the guidance clearly indicates that a furloughed, uh, somebody who's shielding can be furloughed. Um, I think the risk for me and something that we'd need to take into consideration is the actual nature of the condition that means they're shielding and whether that may amount to a disability within the meaning of disability in the Equality Act. And um, clearly if we're selecting them on that basis and perhaps only paying 80%, I think it does open the door to 
um, a claim or possibly an argument that they're being treated less favourably, i.e. being paid 80% as a consequence of their condition. But certainly the guidelines say that furloughed, uh, sorry, employees who are shielding um, can be furloughed. Can I just add something to that as well? That um, in some circumstances, particularly if uh, somebody who's isolating themselves, um, they're not sick, nobody in their house is sick, they're just with somebody that's vulnerable or extremely vulnerable to this condition. Um, if they are facing circumstances where they might be unpaid, um, if they isolate for a period, be it the next four, eight or 12 weeks in the cases of uh, extremely vulnerable groups. Um, and I think there will be some pressure um, to below them um, in that they will be requesting it. The, the guidance doesn't uh, prevent um, an employer following somebody. As Gary said, it would be very difficult to have a selection criteria that furloughs people that have particular health conditions. That would probably be discriminatory uh, in some cases. Um, but employees might request that rather than be uh, told to stay at home uh, without pay, they may well request, well, why can't you put me on furlough leave? And I think if you certainly if you've got people requesting it or volunteering and you're happy to accept their request or their, uh, their voluntary application, for uh, to be followed, um, then I think it can be done. Okay. Um, one co-op in an unfortunate position, they've got no cash reserve, no trade, no income, um, no likelihood of obtaining a loan. It seems likely we would not be able to furlough our workers. Is it possible to either lay people off or make them redundant until the situation changes, even if not mentioned in their contracts? Um, going back to the, if they're not going to furlough, then the choices are really the, the statutory um, layoff um, scheme, um, which provides for guaranteed pay. Um, you could also, um, if they're agreeable to it, um, reach some arrangement where they're laid off without pay. There's nothing to prevent um, an agreement being reached where an employer and employee agree that the employee will be laid off without any pay, not even guaranteed pay, but that certainly would need to be an express agreement. Um, failing all of that, then yeah, we're into the territory, unfortunately, of redundancy. Um, but yeah, the, there are sort of a, a couple of options other than furloughing. The, 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 the last one is redundancy, but there is the possibility that you could agree with them to be laid off with the guaranteed pay that we discussed earlier, or, in fact, laid off without pay if they agree to it. That would mean their employment would continue, uh, but just without pay. Um, if they're made redundant, clearly you would need to go through a procedure uh, and make them redundant. Whether they'd be entitled to a redundancy payment would depend on the length of service. But actually that, that latter option, the redundancy, would mean that their employment then ends, it terminates, they're no longer an employee. And kind of linked to that is they cannot afford to pay workers until they receive a furlough payment. Um, any advice? I guess that's more business advice, but that it does go to show what sort of situations people are dealing with out there. These are tricky, aren't they? Um, obviously, if you go on our website, there are links to different types of support. <clears throat> that are available and the government's position is that you should try and get one of the other kinds of grants. You should be speaking to your local authority um, to see if there's a, a, a means of in some way bridging that gap. Um, if you've tried all of those things um, and there really is no other way out, uh, you might need to consider putting people on unpaid leave until you recover um, sums uh, sums paid. Um, so 
it, it's a tricky tricky one but the government are saying do not uh make people redundant um for the time being um so if you can't pay them um it's not really having an agreement that they will be on unpaid leave it's sending them home and you can't pay them because you don't have the money and you can't get access to those grants but they are saying don't make them redundant um the scheme will come through um in terms of annual leave then as well and um in relation to furloughing can you continue to accrue annual leave whilst on furlough leave Okay. Yes, my understanding is yes, as, as a furloughed employee, you remain an employee and all the terms and conditions of your employment continue to apply during that period of, um, of furlough. Well, thank you. Kate, Just did you want to add anything to, to that? No, thank you. I was going to say exactly what Gary said, but I was too slow getting my unmute button. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just to go back to the point Tim was making about employees who are um, laid off without pay. I mean, clearly, if an employee's agreed that with you, then there's probably not going to be any difficulties. Um, one of the things I should point out, and it, it doesn't appear to apply with the, the, the job retention or the furlough scheme, is with the statutory layoff scheme, um, or were perhaps an employee's agreed to be laid off without pay, um, those provisions provide that if you're on less than half a week's pay um, for any four consecutive weeks or any six weeks in 13, um, the employee can come back and ask to be made redundant. So if they're not on the furloughed scheme, if they're just on layoff because perhaps you can't afford to pay them, um, there is a provision in, in, in that legislation that allows the employee, if they're on half a week's pay for, for any four consecutive weeks or any six weeks in 13, they can come back and ask you as the employer to make them redundant. Okay, that's a really interesting point. Um, some asking whether we're gonna produce a, either a checklist or some kind of resource, template letters, uh, can they be available to help um, to furlough employees? Um, there is no particular template on furloughing employees, as I understand it. Can anyone help there? I, I've certainly drafted a, a letter um, for um, our members. Certainly, I've used forwarded one to one particular member who asked me to draft one. Um, there is a standard one on expert HR, actually, but it just explains that you are being furloughed. Okay. Um, and there will be some resources as well on the um, on the website. So keep looking at that uk.coop. Um, if it's not exactly what you need, it's always been updated. So it's worth checking back into that website and just seeing what's available at that time. Um, it's going to be about timing and furloughing. Will it last more than three months? Do you think it's likely? Do we know? The, the um, furloughing scheme is is three months, so it's first of March to the end of June. Um, will it be extended? Um, we don't know the answer to that, um, but it's in for a fixed period, uh, and it will be reviewed near the end. I think we'll just have to see um, uh, whether the economy is moving again and people are back in work and we're, we have far less restrictions by the end of june um but we can't speculate <clears throat> but we do know this scheme is in from the beginning of march to the end of uh to june sorry it's first it'll be <clears throat> march april and may three months okay and um more questions on uh, both zero contracts and also very few hours that you're employed in. So is there a minimum threshold for claims? Can we claim for staff who are only contracted for eight hours per month, for example, and also on a zero contract with varied hours, does the employer make ongoing payments based on the average or is it just a one-off payment? So we Zero hours, if you've got people on variable hours or zero hours, um, 
you're looking at um, average earnings. Um, I said earlier that uh, you can look at how much they earned in the same month the previous year or an average of their monthly earnings for the last year. Um, but it does say in relation to zero hours, um, they then average earnings can be used. Does it say anything more about um, do you pay the employee or do the, does the employee get paid in a one-off payment or does it kind of, is it ongoing um, as, as would normally a salary be? So I think where you've got an average earnings, so say if somebody, I think in the example you gave there, it was eight hours per month on average, you'd make, um, uh, you'd pay them eight hours a month It'd be up to you, whatever normal pay cycle you use, whether that's weekly or monthly. Um, but you pay them those eight hours. Um, and provided they're for load for more than three weeks, uh, you can make a claim for 80% uh, of their average earnings. Okay. Um, can you furlough an employee who can't and doesn't want to work because of new childcare responsibilities related to COVID-19 nursery school closures? I think, I think we've gone through that one, haven't we? Yes. It's, it's the same point about people that are vulnerable, somebody in your house that's vulnerable. At the moment, there's, there's nothing um, suggesting that it cannot be done. <clears throat> but it'd be very dangerous as a selection criteria for forced, for where you're trying to impose following on a number of people, but where you're trying to deal with things through agreement, <clears throat> you might seek volunteers. I don't say anything wrong with seeking volunteers or responding to requests, can I be furloughed? I don't see anything wrong with uh, considering those as an employer, no matter how they were motivated. Uh, so it's the same answer we gave for vulnerable groups uh, earlier. Okay. Um, do we know when employers are likely to receive their first? It says grant payment from HMRC. Um, so I guess that's small business grant. I, I'm, I'm not aware of when that will be paid. I don't know that you've got anything. I think it's going to be... Once the scheme comes into play in April, <clears throat> you're going to be able to put claims through and you're going to set up some of the details they require from you, <clears throat> are things like your bank account details. And they're suggesting that these are going to be paid very quickly indeed um, by back transfer. Okay. Do we need agreement in writing from our employees that they accept the furlough conditions? Um, it's why it's why to get every, anything in writing if you can possibly. I can't imagine. I mean, the alternative, and if people are agreeing, there's no reason why you wouldn't document that. Certainly, in advising employers, it's wise to document every agreement, really. But um, and and I do think you will probably need at some point when they're carrying out the audit. Um, in fact, I think having said that, I think the scheme does require you to provide some evidence uh, to. Um, HMRC that it has been you, these employees have agreed and have been furloughed so you would need something in writing yes yeah I've, I've seen that Gary in the guidance it says um, the point you made earlier you must agree it um, once it's agreed your employer must write to you confirming that you've been furloughed and uh, certainly we can put a very generic uh, template uh, on the website uh, quite quickly if people are interested in seeing what a following letter might look like. Okay. We're just coming to the last five minutes of the webinar. Obviously, there's a lot of questions um, to go through still. Just to note that these questions are all going to be recorded so we can... Um, go back to these and um, have a look at them and then provide them as a resource later for everyone that's on the webinar. So if you haven't been, if your question hasn't been asked at this time, um, bear with us. We'll probably be sending all of this out to your email anyway that you've registered with. So um, 
just a couple more. As I understand it, staff whose fixed term contracts end today can be furloughed as long as we extend their contracts today. Is that correct? Uh, you wouldn't treat um, a fixed term employee differently than anyone else. Um, if you're going to extend the contract, then um, you would do so. If you're going to extend the contract and they need to be furloughed, I can't see that um, that would make any difference. Um, certainly, you know, you wouldn't be not extending it just because they're fixed term employees. Uh, that might cause some difficulty. I don't know whether you've got anything to add on that, Tim. No, I think so long as they were on PAYE on the 28th of February, um, there's no reference to employers having to stand by fixed terms and let people go. Um, and that would seem the opposite of what they're trying to achieve. There's nothing suggesting that there'll be any restrictions on you uh, extending fixed term contracts. Um, okay, in the last few moments as well, if you if the participants want to upvote any burning questions that you've seen that hang in there for a while and you just want us to make sure that we get those asked first, please upvote any questions that you can see there. Um, Giovanna, I know that you've got some specific inquiries there. I think if you want to email those to membership at uk.coop, um, we can look at that um, offline. Um, how do we distinguish between full-time and part-time employees and employees whose pay varies? Um, well, you should have in your contracts um, some reference to what a full-time working week uh, is. Um, and if certainly if you're prorating anything, you must be working on a full-time uh, working week to be able to prorate things for part-timers. Um, <clears throat> there's no distinction between part-time staff and people whose um, who's earnings vary. Um, as I say, the focus, obviously a salaried employer, a salaried employee who doesn't have variable wages, it's going to be pretty easy to um, See which was the higher, <clears throat> i.e., their pay in the same month a year ago, or the, their last 12 months of earnings. Uh, usually, it would be the average earnings over the last 12 months. So, for somebody salaried, it will be quite simple. But as soon as we get into zero hours, part-time staff that occasionally work overtime, we're into the um, averaging. I think. Um, but it's the same essential calculation. There's one calculation of how you calculate how much you can claim. Okay. We are coming to the last couple of minutes. I just wonder whether there's um, any overriding comments that the panel want to make before we um, call off. And, um, and then I'll just let people know how else they can get in touch with us. Um, but yeah, um, Tim, Gary, Kate, you wanted to say anything before we leave? So if, I think my concluding uh, point for uh, people would be to do keep checking on our website because as we learn more and more information, we are updating the FAQs that are, that are posted up there. Um, I, I think it's probably the best way of keeping live FAQs um, in one place. Um, and certainly as new legislation or guidance comes out, um, you will find uh, information about it on there. Okay, thank you. Gary? I just echo what Tim says really. It's, um, it's certainly been a bit of a change in landscape in the last couple of weeks. Um, we were given sort of general information and you know the, the guidance has been coming out and it's been more detailed. So um, keep looking at the website. We will be updating it on a frequent basis as that new guidance and the new details of the schemes come out. Thank you. Anything from you, Kate? Um, yes, yeah, so I was just going to add, obviously, it's a really difficult time for everybody. And, um, you know, hopefully we've been able to answer some of your legal questions today. If there are any other questions 
got around general policy or employee relations through this time, please do continue to send them to our advice mailbox and you know we'll get to them and we'll answer them as we can. We do have some information on our website around um, employee well-being and considering your employees through this difficult time. So also please take a look at that. Um, and like I said, any other questions that that are more around sort of how you support your employees through this difficult time, please do um, point them to our advice mailbox and, and we'll come back to you. Okay, thank you. And that's to advice at uk.coop. So you can email either to advice.uk at uk.coop or membership at uk.coop uh, where, we, where we'll field a lot of these inquiries coming in. If you think that actually we could do with uh, more of these webinars and perhaps another HR webinar, um, please let us know. We're, we're reacting to what our members require and what our members are asking for. So we're, we've been quite agile in the way that we've converted all of our physical events and have now converted them online we can certainly add more as we go so if that's something that's really important to you you think you would be um, subscribing to these uh, webinars then let us know again at membership at uk.coop um, you can also subscribe to our newsletter and um, that's a really good way of keeping up to date um, with the information that's being fielded out so that's um, you can find that on uk.coop slash email. So that's on our website. Just go in there and subscribe to our newsletter at uk.coop slash um, email. And um, just make sure that you're aware of some of the other things that we're doing in terms of bringing cooperatives together. So the Co-op Connection series of events, um, which begins on the 7th of April in Bristol, the 8th of April in London, and so on. Um, we've got a whole raft of those going on, perhaps somewhere near you. Thankfully, now you don't have to travel to those. We can get more people involved in those, and it's a really good way of connecting with those in your region. Um, again, we'll be go guided by what our members require of those, and uh, we'll certainly be um, available to answer some of the, or at least talk about some of the challenges that you're really facing. Um, so thank you, everybody, and apologies to those that we haven't managed to answer questions. They are recorded. We will try and get back to um, as many as we possibly can and keep in touch with us and we hope everyone stays well and healthy. Thanks very much to everyone. Thanks to our panelists and to all our participants. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye, everyone.